Okay, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our grassroots uh, LGBT tour of the Grunge Village. Um, the LGBT Historic Sites Project was chosen to be a grassroots awardee this year. And obviously we couldn't do the original plan of having our grassroots party. So we've broken up all of the events into uh, various tiny things. Tonight we are doing a tour. We also have um, another two events scheduled where uh, we have two groups each night doing short presentations. You can find all the information on our website, hdc.org. Uh, the LGBT Historic Sites was chosen for a grassroots because they have done amazing work. I'm sure most of you are aware of this, I would assume, but uh, really getting uh, the information and advocating on behalf of the very, very little known LGBT sites around his um, around New York City and even getting several designated last year, which was amazing. They were also a Six to Celebrate group as part of our cultural sites last year. And we have been very happy to continuously work with them. They very much deserve this award. They've done great, great work in a short amount of time. Uh, their website's also amazing. I believe it's lgbtsites.org. NYC. There you go. I'm like, it's very long. lgbtnycsites.org. I'll say it at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, Google it, really, you'll find it. Uh, but with that, I will hand it over to Andrew and Ken. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so th I want to thank HTC uh, for the award. Uh, and uh, we, this was supposed to be a real walking tour, but we're going to do a virtual walking tour. So you won't get the exercise that you would have gotten if we'd actually met tonight. Uh, in, in, in front of Stonewall uh, and done that. And this is gonna be done uh, by Ken Luspader and myself. We're two of the three co-founders of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Projects. This is uh, uh, an issue that we've been interested in uh, for about a quarter of a century or more. Uh, and um, Ken wrote his master's thesis at Columbia uh, on, on LGBT sites in Greenwich Village. Ken is of course a consultant. Uh, he's worked for the New York Landmarks Conservancy for the J.M. Kaplan Fund and, and, and others. And I'm a professor um, of historic preservation at Columbia. Uh, I'm sure I know, I don't know, because it's a webinar, I can't see anybody. I don't know who's on the tour, but I suspect I know a lot of you uh, because I've been involved with HTC uh, for, for a long time. So we're going to go back and forth uh, uh, talking about these sites uh, in the village. And I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Ken, who's going to give an introduction, but first I'm going to uh, share the screen. All right. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be changing the slides so you'll hear Ken sometimes saying next, so I know that it's time to, to change. So I'm gonna give a very brief overview of who we are as a project. Um, as Michelle was saying, we are the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. Every word in that title is very important, but the website is very long. You'll see it in a couple of seconds. Um, but the goal of our project is basically to make an invisible history visible. We're a cultural heritage initiative and educational resource documenting LGBT sites from the 17th century to the year 2000. And I should mention that they're extant sites and these sites convey LGBT history as well as uh, embed uh, and convey LGBT influence on American culture. So we have an image here of our uh, map on our website. We've got about 260 documented sites. They're categorized by building type. On the right, you can see the building types. And then we have filters on the left that assign a cultural significance to each one. And you can enter the website and see these 270 sites that basically are a mini exhibition with archival information, statements of significance, as well as resources. And it's really a launching point for people to educate themselves others about this topic. Next. Um, if the map is a little overwhelming, we've made it a little easier with 24 categories of curated themes, which are mini tours. Um, here's an example of some of them. Um, and each one that we add, as we add sites, we've got about 300 more to research that we're um, adding uh, each year. 
Uh, next, please. As Andrew mentioned, we are, um, as an initiative, we are documenting sites and, and showing a, an unknown history. This is the Alice Austin House, for example, when we started the project. It was in, to increase diversity on the National Register. There were, at the time, only two of the 93,000 sites on the register document uh, listed for LGBT history. So we're sites and adding new ones. This is the amendment that we did for Alice Austin on Staten Island, which didn't include anything about her same-sex relationship with Gertrude Tate, which uh, lasted for over 50 years. 30 of the years were in this house, nor did it really go into her transgressive uh, photography. You could see Alice standing here next to two friends uh, in male drag with a rather provocative um, umbrella sticking out from the seated person. Um, and this was, you know, late 19th, early 20th century photography on Staten Island. Next, we're also working to advocate for local landmark designations. We were involved in getting Stonewall, hopefully advocating um, for more, but this is Stonewall. And then six others last year were designated by the uh, New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. All cultural info, our website and social media, if you um, could, you, you could find us by just simply Googling LGBT history in New York and we come up first. So I'm going to hand it back to Andrew now. Uh, so um, if we were out in the city uh, tonight, we would have been meeting across the street from Stonewall in Christopher Park. Uh, and before, I think probably most of you know about Stonewall because it was such a, an enormous event uh, last year on the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. So standing here across from Stonewall, I just want to give you a little context. I always like to start a tour with some contextual idea of why what we're going to be seeing is here. So um, Greenwich Village in the early 20th century, as I think a lot of you know, uh, became a sort of center for the bohemian world. Uh, and that was mostly centered around Washington Square. And although the bohemians were not necessarily welcoming of, of same-sex relationships. There were um, many LGBT people involved in the bohemian movement, and P LGBT people felt that it was a, a, a milieu in which they could be comfortable. And so around Washington Square, a number of tea houses and uh, coffee houses and bars uh, thrived uh, during this period. In the post-World War II period, especially about in the late 50s and early 60s, gay life begins to move westward to the area around Sheridan Square and Christopher Park. And you begin to get gay bars um, and, and uh, other places with a lot of LGBT patrons. Also, throughout the late 19th and the early 20th century, the sort of liberal bohemian character of the village became a kind of welcoming place where same-sex couples felt comfortable living. And so we're going to see those things uh, as we look at the 17 sites that we're going to examine uh, tonight. So I don't want to go into detail about Stonewall, but you know, this is where uh, the Stonewall Rebellion occurred uh, in 1969 uh, and was a really transitional point in LGBT history. And I think it's really important to remember, and we're going to talk about uh, this in a number of sites, that there was gay activism before Stonewall, that Stonewall did not begin the history of LGBT rights uh, in New York or in America. Uh, there was a lot that was building up uh, to it. Uh, and, but it had an enormous influence uh, almost immediately. Uh, can I have the next, please? Oh, I'm doing the next, I'm doing them. So it was mostly by street, uh, by street uh, kids. Uh, some uh, trans individuals were involved over the several nights. Uh, and you can see the street kids uh, here, uh, photographed by Fred McGarrett for the Village Voice. And you can see the Stonewall just after the rebellion, just a, a day or two after, uh, with a vertical sign uh, on it. And it's important to note that this was not the first time that bar patrons had, had fought back uh, after a raid. There had been examples in Los Angeles and San Francisco. I think what the difference was and why Stonewall was so influential is that uh, 
it took place at a time when the civil rights movement for African American rights, the women's movement, and other civil rights uh, fights were, were, were in the news, and gay people began to say, it's our time too, we want to be part of, of, of this. Also, the fact that it took place in the media capital of America, and the fact that it took place in Greenwich Village, where the streets are a very dense, irregular pattern, lots of people um, there for the nightlife and got involved. And also, when the police chased the demonstrators away, they could double back uh, along the, 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 the oddly set streets and come right back to where they began. So it was very hard to disperse the crowd. And so all those things were really important. And they led almost immediately to uh, activist organizations um, being founded uh, after Stonewall. And it got a lot of publicity. As you can see here with the wonderful uh, Daily News headline, Homo Nest Raided, Queen Bees Are Singing Mad. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken. OK, uh, next. <clears throat> Uh, th this is a uh, Christopher Park, which uh, was is located directly opposite the Stonewall Inn. Uh, Christopher Park was designated uh, in 1936 with a statue of General Sheridan. That's why it's often confused as Sheridan Square. However, that's around the corner. But this area became was really important in the late 60s. As Andrew mentioned, a lot of the street youth these were kids that were thrown out of their homes. They hung out in the park. And they basically were the people who contributed to Stonewall and the uprising. And the park itself is where a lot of the activity took place during the six uh, days or evenings of Stonewall. Uh, on the left is a photograph of Marty Robinson in a month after Stonewall. And this really shows the importance of what people were doing immediately after Stonewall, recognizing the energy. They marched from Wa uh, Washington Square Park to Christopher Park, had a rally, and really wanted to still get the police out of the bars. Stonewall, as you know, was a mafia-run bar. The police were, were back and forth with entrapment and payoffs and so forth. Uh, to the left is the George Siegel statue sculpture that was um, to be placed in the park in the 80s. It was not due to controversy. It was finally installed in 1992. Uh, and this is in his signature uh, white patina. Uh, and it was commissioned to depict the Stonewall uprising, to commemorate it but they specifically did not want to have anything other than showing a loving relationship between two homosexual couples. And it was specifically to be a man, two men and two women. So this uh, had a, has had a lot of controversy. It initially had controversy. Um, it's sort of been a, an accepted landmark in the park um, and is still uh, sort of looked mm -hmm. at with uh, a bit of um, concern because of the sort of cisgendered white uh, depictions here. Next. It's important to note that the park now and the surrounding environment were designated a national monument by President Barack Obama in 2016. It's the first and only national monument. This shows the boundaries of the park and the little triangle in red is actually the park, the national park ownership because the federal government has to have a toehold, federal ownership, uh, HDC was initially involved and involved in the advocacy for this, uh, but the park boundaries ex ex extend to the streets that Christopher, uh, that Andrew described, where the action of uh, the evenings took place. And you could see they're off the grid, so they contributed to this sort of cat and mouse game. And it, the park itself was part of the National Register do designation done in 1999 with Andrew and Jay Shockley. And this really paved the way for the National Monument because that document from 99 legitimized the amount of research and that the monument was really important and the most significant LGBT lo location in the US. Next. Andrew, is it? Yeah. Oh, did I get this wrong or am I doing it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, th this is the offices of the Mattachine Society. Um, if you go back one, it's three doors down from Stonewall. Um, and rather uh, poignantly, from 1972 to 1976, this was the location of Mattachine's offices. Um, Mattachine Society was an organization that was established in 1950 in California. Um, its New York chapter was opened in 1955. Mattachine, along with the Daughters of Elitis, 
uh, were the two leading homophile groups of the time. Daughters of Belitis was established in California in 55 with a, um, a chapter in New York in 1957. And Mattachine and Daughters of Belitis really fought for equality. They wanted to demonstrate that LGBT people were being oppressed, but that they were employable. Uh, they came out of uh, during a period of the Red Scare in the 1950s, where the federal government sort of routed out anyone who was homosexual next. Um, and they were really on the forefront of uh, engaging the public with demonstrations. These are the reminder days. They did a series of demonstrations on July 4th from 1965 through 1969, just a day after the end of Stonewall. And then quickly here are sort of the key players in the LGBT homophile movement. Uh, that's Frank Kameny on the left. Barbara Giddings is in the center holding her, the sign. Uh, behind her is Randy Wicker, who is active in the um, Julius's, which you'll hear about. And on the left, in, uh, the African-American woman on the right is Ernestine Eckstein. She was one of the few African-American women in the homophile movement. Next. Then we've got Barbara Giddings again with Dick Leitch. Dick Leitch was uh, the president of because Craig Rodwell left in the right photo. Uh, they were dating and Craig said, I'm going to a meeting, you should join me. But these are all photographs at the annual reminder days, which were really brave protests in the 1960s before Stonewall. And our goal is to really show that there was an active movement advocating for visibility and equality. Next. Andrew, or my- This is yours too. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so this is the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop. Uh, it opened in 1967 on Mercer Street, um, and it was started by Craig Rodwell. Uh, here he is, a uh, photograph with his mother, uh, and a great poster or from a, from a brochure about the uh, bookshop. Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop was the first uh, LGBT bookshop in the country. He was a Christian scientist. He came to New York from Indiana. As a young man, under, he was 18, he wanted to join Mattachine, but they told him he couldn't. He eventually did join Mattachine because he came of age. Uh, and he felt that they needed to have outreach to the public and should not be in an office building or sequestered away. He was a Christian scientist. So he wanted something street level to be like a Christian science reading room where people can go and read literature. He picked the name Oscar Wilde because it was the most famous homosexual he could think of. Uh, and he also wanted to sell literature, not just pornography. So he stacked the place with books uh, and it became a meeting place. And not just, you know, yeah, People need to understand the bars were meeting places, but they were mafia controlled. There were very few places for people to meet and convene. He moved to this location in 1973, next. And um, it became such a famous stomping ground for people, for readings, for people to promote their books. Harvey Firestein on the left here in 1982 with Torch Song Trilogy. On the right is Tennessee Williams wearing that fur coat in 1976. Craig is standing next to him with some other people who were um, employees of the bookshop. Um, he is really one of the unsung heroes, Craig Rodwell, of the LGBT rights movement. And he passed away of uh, cancer in 1993. Next. Um, so speaking of Craig Rodwell, um, I mentioned the reminder days in Mattachine and homophile movement. So Stonewall happens. July 3rd, it ends. July 4th is the reminder days in Philadelphia. Craig Rose down there. They're walking not in the conservatively dressed manner that you saw in those earlier photographs. They're, they're wearing long hair and holding hands with each other. He wanted to take that energy and have a national gay holiday starting in New York City. And he moved the reminder days to New York to create what was then called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. He planted in this apartment building at 350 Bleecker Street. Um, you can see in the thumbnail there. Um, and he planned it to, with the intention of having next a march that really allowed people to express liberation and to be who they are. Um, here's a photograph of the first poster advertising the march, um, which we are selling, we'll get to in a moment. But look at this great graphic called Christopher Street Liberation Day. It was not recognizing Stonewall because Stonewall was a seedy mafia bar um, and they kicked off on Waver, uh, Washington Place to go up Sixth Avenue 
garnering thousands of people by the time they got to the Gay Inn in Central Park. Next, you can see them here marching um, off. The Gay Activist Alliance was one of the organizations that came right out of after Stonewall, along with the Gay Liberation Front. This is uh, 12th Street at 6th Avenue. Next. And Gay Liberation Front was the other organization that um, organized and came into being in 1970 and 1969. And here they are in the Gay Inn. Next. And it got press. Uh, and it was not derisive press that, uh, such as the Stonewall uh, Daily News article, this was actually a legitimate article. So this really paved the way of branding Stonewall, making it so important. And other cities around New York, uh, the state, and around the country had their own marches, and now there are about 300 marches throughout the world. Thank you, Ken. Um, so the village attracted uh, gay people uh, for, for many years before uh, Stonewall, uh, and particularly uh, here right by the, the, the Christopher Street station on the number, on the number one train. Uh, in this Art Deco taxpayer, uh, which is and uh, Christopher Street was a cafeteria called Stewart's, which you can see here. And Stewart was a place where gay life was on public display. As uh, one person wrote, it was where dykes, fags, pansies, lesbians, and others of that unfortunate ilk could be seen. Uh, and and um, it, it became a, a, a kind of place of spectacle where tourists would come and stand outside, sometimes apparently three and four people deep, to watch the antics of what was going on uh, inside. It opened um, in the early 19, in 1933, uh, and in 1935, the owner, it was closed because the owner was convicted of a public nuisance and running a disorderly house. And according to the district attorney, it was, and this, the language here is really amazing. The district attorney's complaint says, certain persons of the homosexual type and certain persons of the lesbian type to remain therein and engage in acts of sapphism and diverse other lewd, obscene, indecent and disgusting acts and it was a rendezvous for perverts, degenerates, homosexuals, and other evil disposed persons. I mean, I really love that, that, the, that, that I would have been an evil disposed person um, at, at the time. So the, it was closed down, and it almost immediately reopened as li the life cafeteria. Uh, and it had uh, the same kind of clientele. In fact, the WPA Guide to New York City refers to the life cafeteria and it notes how, um, how conventional people sat on one side and what the, what the WPA Guide sit calls eccentrics sat on the other side. Um, and and um, the, the, um, in 1933, a publication called Broadway Brevities uh, in, in, in a, um, oh, 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 sorry, we'll get, we'll get to that. This is a, um, an image by the artist Paul Cadmus, whom we're going to hear more about later, called Greenwich Village Cafeteria. And this is a painting of Stewart's Cafeteria. And um, Cadmus was what's known as a magic realist. They're sort of surreal views, but they're hyper-realistic. He was particularly interested in, in people's, getting people's clothing correctly. And what you should note is the guy on the right here uh, peering out at you and sort of uh, inviting you to come into the bathroom with him, uh, and, you know, which was a, 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 a homosexual uh, come on uh, in, this, in that, that corner of the image. And this is typical of Cadmus's work. They often have a kind of uh, gay subtext going on in, in, in some portion of, of the painting. So here's Broadway Brevities, uh, it's scoops. Broadway Brevities often wrote things that were a bit homophobic, and I love this, so I'm going to read it. In Sheridan, of New York's Greenwich Village is a restaurant, one of a large chain. In this restaurant nightly are enacted many incidents that could furnish the plot of a novel on erotica. The place is a gathering spot for that nocturnal clan, the third sexers. Dykes, fags, pansies, lesbians, and others of that unfortunate ilk 
convene their nightly, parading their petty jealousies and affairs of the heart. And then it goes on to tell uh, one of these stories of a, of a lesbian couple uh, that come in and the young woman is uh, attracted by a, an innocent lad uh, and a fight ensues uh, over here. So this was a, ma through the 1930s, this was a major site. Even in the late 1930s, um, Marlon Brando um, came to the site at a time when Marlon Brando is going to have uh, gay relationships. Uh, he comes uh, and, and he stands outside uh, and he says, and he, and he sees what's going on and he decides to go inside and, and, and uh, find out for himself. And he writes, the rednecks were pointing at the diners like animals in a zoo. It was a me I was immediately intrigued and ventured in. Before I left that afternoon, I discovered that many of the homosexual men were actually putting on a show for the jam. And by jam, he meant the people out on the street. So it's interesting that, that, that the, the gay crowd inside understood that they were being watched and they're putting on a show uh, here. So I'm gonna hand it back to Ken. Okay. Um, this is the location of the Duchess, a lesbian bar that operated here from 1972 to 1982. Um, after 82, it had iteration, four iterations of other lesbian bars until 1992. Um, and it's important to note, we don't really have that many lesbian bars on this tour, although our website has documented numerous uh, bars. Uh, particularly in the 1950s, um, lesbian bars like others were um, mafia controlled. They were often uh, catering to a working class, butch clientele, white working class. There was a lot of racial discrimination. The mafia controlled sort of entries and exits, watered down drinks and so forth. Um, the Duchess opens just on the cusp of like the mafia getting out of gay bars uh, in 72 and it attracted a racially and economically diverse crowd. Guidebooks at the time described it as having a friendly and relaxed atmosphere, popular with women, uh, with movement women, and with a relaxed feminist atmosphere. So completely in contrast to the mafia bars that we have talked about on other tours. Um, they allowed you to go to the bathroom alone without uh, giving you know, other bars, gave out uh, patrons a set amount of toilet paper because they didn't want people going in and, and clogging up toilets. It was a terrible situation. So Alison Bechtel, who's the cartoonist and uh, author of the graphic novel, Fun Home, said of the bar, you'd step past the bouncer at the Duchess and you were home free. It afforded me the space to just be with my guard down and that was salvation completely different uh, type of bar and showing the importance of bars as social entry points for people. In 1980, however, the Duchess ran into legal trouble for not serving alcohol for men, which was considered an act of discrimination, which then led to the state liquor authority closing the bar and they lost their liquor license. Rather ironically for women who were not as privileged or in power, uh, they needed to create a safe space, but we lost it for these the very reasons of needing to have a, a safe uh, entry point. Uh, 1982, the Duchess basically says we're going to be selling um, alcohol no matter what. They get then they raided the bar and arrested the owner and the bartender. They tried selling juice after that, and soon after the bars closed, and then uh, went into other iterations. But here's a here's just a type the flyer here shows you what it meant for the community and what type of bar it was. Uh, next. I want to just note that, that you know, most people would throw away something like this. And, the, and we have found a lot of these advertising broadsides and they are an, they are an incredible record. Uh, so think about that when you're, when, you, when you're ready to throw things away that you know, somebody's garbage is, is some historian's incredible archival find. So right next door to the Duchess is this one-story building uh, that was created when 7th Avenue South was plowed through in the early 20th century, and it created uh, all of these little leftover triangular sites. Uh, uh, and this becomes the home of the Circle Repertory Theater. Uh, you can see it was built as a garage. Uh, the Circle Repertory Theater uh, was founded in 1969, and in the early 1970s, they move into this uh, building. The Circle Rep was founded by four people uh, two of whom were uh, gay playwright Langford Wilson and gay director Marshall Mason. Uh, and Mason, in fact, 
directed most of Langford Wilson's uh, plays. Uh, and here you can see the circle rep on the left when it was active, and that's Langford Wilson on, on the right. Uh, it was here that the 5th of July and, ha and Tally's Follies uh, premiered. Uh, this is, and they also supported other gay playwrights. It wasn't a gay theater. They did a, a lot of plays that, had not, that were not uh, LGBT related, but they were particularly welcoming. One of the first off-Broadway theater companies to particularly welcome, uh, and in fact, Mel Gussow said that it was, that the Circle Rep was the chief provider of new American plays. Uh, he said that in 1974. Um, this is where the play As Is uh, began. Uh, as Is was, uh, was the, the, first, the first play to deal with AIDS. Uh, and and was uh, started here and moves to Broadway. So this was a really important center uh, for the legitimization of gay themed theater. Uh, we're going a little further south. Uh, this is Cafe Chino, another theater. Um, and Cafe Chino operated from here. This is on Cornelia Street between 1958 and 1968. It's the birthplace of off off Broadway theater. Um, and it was a really important space um, for the development of uh, gay plays, gay playwrights and actors, um, because it was done during a period when homosexuality, it was illegal to depict homosexuality on the stage. This is, you know, 1958 in New York City. Um, it was established by Joe Chino, next. Um, Joe Chino seen here on the left wearing the sort of rolled up sweatshirt um, in the center is Maggie Dominic. Um, we recently had uh, Cafe Chino listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It was also designated an individual city landmark last year. Um, but it's really an important um, space. Playwrights such as Lanford Wilson, who Andrew just mentioned, got his start here with a play called The Madness of Lady Bright. It explicitly dealt with homosexuality and it really put Chino on the map. Joe Chino came from Buffalo. He um, wanted to establish a space that was a coffee house, uh, an art studio, artist venue, where people can come and linger. And they put on these plays, these avant-garde plays, every two weeks or so. You could see the black and white photo on the right. It was a small space. And basically, they pushed the chairs aside that were for the cafe during the day and put a little platform in the center and did these amazing plays. So Dork Wilson was another playwright here, Tom Ian, um, and it's where uh, the wonderful Bernadette Peters got her break as a teenager in Dames at Sea. This is where Dames at Sea premiered. So this is a really important space for LGBT history and New York City history. Next. Uh, and I should mention that both Langford Wilson and Marshall Nixon, uh began here and then moved to the Circle Rep. And a lot of the other Chino playwrights became active at Circle Rep. So there's, there's a direct relationship uh, between these two theater centers. So we're gonna be walking south now to the sort of southern edge of, of the village where now on St. Luke's Place, just west of 7th Avenue South. And I, I, I wanna note something that we as a project have really been trying to do, and that is add another layer to the history and interpretation of New York's built world. We're, we're very interested in the built fabric and the power of place. And you know, many tours go, go to St. Luke's Place and they talk about the, uh, the beautiful preserved uh, 1860s Italianate style row houses, brick with brownstone trim. And if they point out any individual building, it's uh, the building where uh, New York Mayor uh, James J. Walker uh, lived. But there's a whole nother level of, of history behind many of the buildings that we are familiar with. And there are two buildings in particular on this row that, were, that housed really important figures uh, in, in uh, really important LGBT figures in the art world. Uh, and so we're gonna look at those. Uh, one is number five which was uh, the Paul Cadmus and Jared French, both really important artists who rented an apartment uh, in, in, this, in this building. The, um, they were uh, 
Hadamus and, and French were part of a group of artists, particularly in the 1930s, that have become, uh, come back into fashion in the last year or two. Last year, there was a major uh, exhibition on, on the magic realists, and there was another exhibition at the same time at the Museum of Modern Art about Lincoln Kirstein, who was involved uh, with, with this group. Uh, and and uh, you can see uh, here in two photographs by George Platt Lines, a very important photographer, uh, one of the first to, to take artistic photographs of, of uh, homoerotic photographs of, of men. On the left is a, a picture of, of another artist named George Tucker, who was part of this circle. And in the mirror at the left are Paul Cadmus and Jared French, who were a couple uh, for many years. And on the right uh, is one of about 15 photographs that George Platt Lyons uh, took of Cadmus and French in various states of undress. Uh, so just uh, to, to give you an idea of the kind of art that these people were doing, there's uh, a work by Jared French, uh, who was very in, in, inspired by Piero della Francesca and, and other early Renaissance artists and did these kind of uh, surrealist uh, images, like you can see here. On, in the center uh, is a Paul Cadmus gilding the acrobat, and all four figures in this, according to Cadmus, were modeled by French, uh, and that would include the African American uh, gentleman that you see on the on the left, and there's on the right uh, a, a, a rather surreal image by George Tucker, who uh, was was later uh, the partner of Cadmus. Uh, they they um, French and Cadmus both married, uh, and they were part of of a of of a I'm sorry French married, and and uh, he and his wife. Uh, and Cadmus became, uh, became part of a, a circle on Fire Island every summer that, that uh, took photographs of their mostly gay friends uh, frolicking on the beach and elsewhere uh, on, on Fire Island. So this was a really important uh, center for the, uh, for the life of these artists in this St. Luke's place. Uh, both Cadmus and French were also, um, did, did, did costumes and sets for ballet. And as uh, somebody who loves the ballet, I had to, I, I couldn't resist including these two really homoerotic um, costume designs, which you may have seen at the Museum of Modern Art's Kirstein exhibit last year. Uh, one for Billy the Kid on the left, and the other, which is a transparent costume for a ballet called Filling Station. And down the block at number nine is the home of Arthur Lawrence and, and Tom Hatcher. Uh, Lawrence uh, was born in, in Flatbush in Brooklyn. His name was Arthur Levine uh, when he was born in 1917. Uh, during World War II, he became, uh, he was here in New York and he was a writer for radio propaganda. And he said that, um, that in New York during World War II, everything was rationed except two, the two things everybody wanted most, sex and booze. The city reeked of sex. I whirled in a blend of sex and booze. Uh, and so he became very tuned in to the, 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 the gay world uh, of New York, both here in New York and in California, where he was, went to Hollywood as a screenwriter uh, for a while. His most famous uh, script is for Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, uh, which has a, a, of course has a gay undercurrent played by, um, by two gay actors, um, Farley Granger and John Dahl. Many went back to New York. Uh, writes uh, The Time of the Cuckoo, uh, the, the play on Broadway, and then gets his greatest success with West Side Story, where all of the major figures involved with West Side Story, Arthur Lawrence, Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, Jerome Robbins, uh, Oliver Smith, the set designer, Irene Sharif, the costume designer, Gene Rosenthal, the lighting designer, they were all gay and lesbian. Uh, so it was just an, uh, an all LGBT uh, uh, production. And then after that, uh, he does the libretto for Gypsy, and it was with the money that he made from West Side Story and Gypsy that he buys this house and moves in with his, his longtime boyfriend, Tom Hatcher, and you see them posing on a diving board uh, in, in Hollywood uh, here in this image. So I'm going to hand it back to, to, to Ken. Ken, you're muted. Ken, you're muted. 
This is the Cherry Lane Theater on Commerce Street. Um, the Cherry Lane Theater, um, many people think Edna St. Vincent Millay had something to do with its founding. It did not. Uh, it operated out of a former uh, stable um, and has this uh, very sort of known history of uh, hosting gay and lesbian productions. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, some of, the, some of them include the death of Bessie Smith, um, entertaining Mr. Sloan, um, which was Joe Wharton, and um, the, it, it became a center here for LGBT productions, and still to this day is much of a host there. Andrew, do you have anything else well, to add know, for Cherry Lane? I think you know, it's mm -hmm. just, it, it, was a, it was founded as a bohemian theater, mm -hmm. and so it was a little bit more open, uh, to to uh, plays with gay themes than 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 other commercial theaters uh, were, uh, and and so there's a, there although it wasn't you know strictly uh, a, a gay theater, it was very welcoming. So just around just around the corner from the Cherry Lane uh, at 50 Commerce Street uh, is a an industrial building that was converted into residences in the early 20th century. And on the fourth floor of this building, Berenice Abbott and Elizabeth McCausland uh, rented two adjoining studios uh, where they lived from 1935 to 1965. Uh, so they had two flats uh, there. They rented this um, in 1935 at just the time when Berenice Abbott received the commission from the Federal Arts Project for her most famous work. Oh, here they are, by the way. Bernice Abbott, uh, who, a photographer, and Elizabeth McCausland, who was a, uh, an art historian and art critic. Uh, so they, they, they rented this in 1935, at just the time when the Federal Arts Project gave uh, Bernice Abbott her most famous commission, uh, which was uh, to do the photography for what became the book Changing New York, with McCausland writing the text. Uh, and this is a book that probably most of you know. These, many of these photographs are incredibly famous. On the left, you see the Empire Stores with its U-Ban coffee ads on it. And on the right is, is uh, a, a, a bakery uh, in, in, in Little Italy. Uh, these have been widely reproduced, um, these, these images. And actually, somebody a few years ago went and reshot each one of these images and tried to figure out exactly the lenses that, that um, Bernice Abbott used. Uh, Abbott was also a portrait uh, a portraitist, uh, and she took portraits of a lot of famous people, including a lot of lesbians. Uh, she photographed Juna Barnes, Janet Flanner, uh, and many others. She also was a pioneer in doing scientific photography, uh, stop action slow motion uh, photography. And McCausland was a very important uh, professor at Barnard of art history and writer and critic in art. And she was one of the pioneers to study and appreciate American art. She wrote the first book about uh, the, the, the late 19th century tonalist painting, George Innes. Uh, she wrote a book on Alfred Moore, whom she considered the first abstract artist in America. And she spent the last 15 years of her life uh, researching the gay artist, uh, Marsden Hartley. So uh, around from that is this very handsome five-story uh, tenement at 85 Bedford Street. And this was the home from 1924 through the late 1960s until their deaths of Anna Rochester and Grace Hutchins, um, whom you see here. Uh, and this brings up a really interesting issue. These were two women who lived together for decades and had a really loving relationship. Uh, and these are what were these were affluent women uh, for, who did not economically need to get married, uh, and they're, they're the kind of relationship that has become known as a Boston marriage, based on Henry James's novel *The Bostonians*, that has some single women characters uh, in them. And these were well-educated, wealthy women. This was the sort of first generation of women that had graduated from the prestigious women's colleges like Smith and Bryn Mawr and Barnard, uh, and they couldn't really get um, employed uh, except in a limited number of, of jobs. So they found their own kinds of work. 
And this includes people like Hutchins in Rochester, but also people like Lillian Wald uh, and Mabel Hyde Kitteridge, uh, who are associated with the Henry Street settlement, of Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook, who were uh, part of Eleanor Roosevelt's circle. Um, Elizabeth Irwin and Kate, Catherine Anthony, Elizabeth Irwin founded, uh, the, founded um, the, the Little Red Schoolhouse in Greenwich Village. And Elizabeth Marbury and Elsie DeWolf, uh, Elsie DeWolf, the first interior, professional interior decorator, and Elizabeth Marbury, a, a theatrical producer, and many others. And these women today, lesbians, even if we don't know what happened uh, when they closed the, the lights at, at night, but these women would never have called themselves lesbians. This is a semantic issue here, because lesbian was a, a word that was associated with working class women in the early years, in the early decades of the 20th century. And these wealthy women uh, would not have identified uh, with that. So it's often that we're giving a contemporary name to these kinds of relationships that they would not have recognized the same, the wording that we would use uh, today. Uh, Grace Hutchins and Anna Rochester grew up in affluent families. They were both Episcopalians uh, and they, they got involved in Episcopal church related um, social activism uh, and they met at a Episcopal church retreat uh, and they moved from this kind of, of, of traditional Episcopal church activism to first becoming socialists and then becoming communists. Uh, uh, especially after they visited Russia, uh, they became communists uh, in the 19. Uh, 30s and they were in the 1920s and they remained communists until they died um, in 1966 and 1969. Um, they found Greenwich Village to be very welcoming. Uh, they were very involved in labor issues, especially in improving the lot of uh, women in the labor market and especially African American women. Uh, and you can see they each wrote extensively uh, for um, an organization that that. Uh, that they established uh, that that was uh, the Labor Research Association, which was uh, independent, but was allied with the Communist Party. And you can see one of H Hutchins books, Women Who Work on the left, and one of Rochester's uh, books on, on the right. Uh, and what's interesting is that in the 1950s, the Communist Party in America basically purged all of its gay and lesbian members. Uh, but Hutchins and Rochester never associated themselves with this group of people. They saw themselves as highly respectable and, and they remained uh, in the Communist Party, uh, as I said, until they die in, in the 1960s. Uh, and, and so it's a really interesting story. And fortunately, all their papers survive, including a lot of personal letters in which they refer to each other very lovingly as partners. And they're, they're archived, uh, I believe, at the University of Oregon. Okay, I'm handing it back to Ken. Thanks, next. <clears throat> we're, we're going a little further north on Bleecker Street, just um, north of Christopher Street. Um, this was the home, if you go back one, of uh, the home of um, Lorraine Hansberry, the noted playwright and activist. Oh, uh, she uh, moved here in 1953 and she lived here until 1960. She moved here when she married her husband, Har um, Robert Nimeroff. And this is where she wrote uh, Raisin in the Sun. A Raisin in the Sun, if most of you are aware of the play, was the first um, play produced on Broadway by an African-American woman. It gave her a lot of success, but at the same time, she was this noted playwright in the public world. She lived a parallel life exploring her um, lesbian sexuality, her homosexuality, and she wrote under a pseudonym for The Daughters of Belitis, which she was a member. She published four essays and poems um, under the pseudonym as, of Emily Jones. Uh, the Daughters of Elitis, as I said, was an early homophile group. They had a national publication and she was part of this group and also had a life socializing with many women. Um, it was rather compartmentalized where she didn't discuss her life as a playwright or her uh, work in civil rights, but she socialized with mostly white lesbian women, one of which was Edie Windsor, 
And at the same time, she then started working on the civil rights movement, movement with James Baldwin. And actually, for those at HDC, got very involved with um, sort of activities near Washington Square Park later because uh, she moved there. Um, she unfortunately died at the age of 34 in 1965 um, as she was working on another play. Next. So this is um, another really interesting site post Stonewall that sort of embodies like the fast changes that took place after the Stonewall uprising. This is the slide, I'm sorry, the snake pit um, located on West 10th um, by Bleecker as well. If you see the gentleman on the left side walking by the railing, uh, that railing leads to a basement bar that operated by, was operated as an after hours club in the basement. Uh, from like 1966 to 1970, late 70s. It was raided in March of 1970 by uh, Seymour Pine, who was the same lieutenant who raided the Stonewall. He did not want to have the same hap occurrence that happened at Stonewall. Well, people on the street who were arrested were, were milling around and started throwing things. So he arrested uh, every one of them, 167 men, Next, they were brought to the 6th Precinct, which at the time was on Charles Street. And um, people, as they were being booked, um, got nervous, one of which was an Argentinian national. He jumped from the window when he was in an office and was impaled on a wrought iron fence. Um, he lives, but the police department couldn't get him off, so they got the fire department. They cut him off. They brought him to St. Vincent's. And this shows what happened immediately after where the Gay Activists Alliance, which was formed in December of 69, along with the Gay Liberation Front formed in July of 1969, handed out this handwritten uh, flyer, which you see here saying, Gay Activists Alliance, the snake pit was raided, we have to get the mafia and the police out of the bars. Look, look at it, any way you look at it, this boy, that boy was pushed, we are all being pushed. So you could see it got 500 people immediately without the cell phone, internet, and so forth to rally by the precinct and the police are lined up here. This uh, really shows the power of the new litigation movement that was much more visible and active soon after Stonewall. It also politicized a number of people, including Morty Manford, who became um, active with the Gay Activist Alliance, Vito Russo, who was known uh, as the uh, LGBT film historian. Before that, they knew about Stonewall, but they were not actively engaged in the movement. Uh, so this is a really important uh, moment. And it also is the precursor to the GAA Zaps, which we talk about on our website, which were theatrical um, embarrassments to garner publicity of, of the way gay people were being treated at that time. Next. And I think it's notable that the last line of the, of the handwritten uh, piece on the right says, there is only the truth to guide us. You know, what a really interesting uh, statement that's so, um, so, so necessary today. Uh, and uh, as Ken has pointed out uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, you know, this, if you just change the police uniforms, this could have been taken uh, last week. So this is a, we got a whirlwind here, and this is our last site. And I think it would have taken us at least two hours to get back here uh, if we if we had been walking uh, in, in in the village. Um, and this is Julius's bar, uh, and this is the site of one of the the most uh, important and really most interesting and most fun uh, uh, events of of the pre Stonewall period when that small group of really courageous activists was intent on getting rules changed uh, so that, that gay people could have the same rights as everybody else. This is a bar that dates back uh, probably to the 19th century. Uh, and and um, it had been, in, in the, during Prohibition, uh, it had become a really popular bar and that's when it was named Julius's. Uh, it became a popular bar with sports figures and news people and celebrities. And if you go inside today, it's completely intact uh, inside with, with celebrity pictures uh, in it. By the 1960s, as the, the, the gay world was beginning to move west, uh, it began to attract uh, uh, gay men, mostly relatively conservative, uh, 
conservatively dressed, which is one reason why it may not have been closed down in various uh, crackdowns on, on places where, where uh, gay people met. In 1964, uh, a woman named Beth Bryant uh, wrote a guidebook called The Inside Guide to Greenwich Village, and she noted that Julius is now attracts an amazing quantity of attractive men and theater notables. Uh, and and um, just after that, um, uh, 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 some, uh, pseudonym, a pseudonymous writer named Petronius wrote a book called New York Unexpurgated. And this is an amazing book. Uh, it has a, a, a chapter that basically is a knowing guide to, the, to gay and lesbian sites uh, in New York City. But it was published by a mainstream press. Uh, and, and so it had to be couched in homophobic language. So the chapter is called The Fag World, and it writes, couples in the back mixed mainly college boys in the front, not always from gay universities, but that way. And I'm assuming that, that my, my forebearers at Columbia probably frequented uh, Julius's. So um, that's an introduction to the so-called sipping. Members of the Manishing Society, including Dick Leish and Craig Rodwell, whom you've already heard about, uh, and Dick Leish's uh, boyfriend at the time, John Timmons, decided that they were going to challenge the, the, the New York State Liquor Authorities uh, uh, and, and the New York State Courts rule that, that the mere presence of a homosexual in a bar was disorderly, and the, a bar that served a disorderly person could lose its license. Uh, and so this made it very difficult for gay people, uh, gay and lesbian people, to be in a bar uh, and order a drink. Uh, um, and so they decided that they were going to challenge this. And they invited the press along, and they were going to go uh, to a bar, order, announce that they were homosexuals, and order a drink, and wait until they were denied a drink, and show that what kind of discrimination there was against gay people. So the first place they went was at 12 St. Mark's Place, where there was a Ukrainian-American uh, restaurant. Uh, and the news people had gotten there first, and they had told the owner uh, that, about what was going to happen. And so the owner, who had a sign over the bar that said, if you're gay, please stay away, uh, closed the bar. So they couldn't, go to, they couldn't go there. So the next thing they did was they went to a Howard Johnson's on 6th Avenue, where the manager laughed at them when they told them that they were homosexuals and wanted a drink and served them. And then they went across the street to a Polynesian-themed bar called the Waikiki. Uh, and the same thing happened. They were served drinks. And then they decided, and these are photographs by Fred McDara, uh, the Village Voice photographer, who has been very generous in allowing, his heirs have been very generous in allowing us to use his images. Um, so then they decided to go to Julius's. Julius's had been raided a few weeks before. They had a sign on the window that said that it had been a raided bar. And so Julius's was about who they served. Uh, and so they went to Julius's. They, they, they announced to the bartender that they were homosexuals and they, they wanted a drink. And Fred McDerrick uh, captured the photograph of the bartender putting his hand over a glass and saying that he could not serve them. And here's Dick Leish and Craig Rodwell and John Timmons. Uh, and here's another Mattachine member named, named uh, uh, Randy Wicker uh, here. Uh, and uh, this got uh, a lot of publicity. And as I always like to say, they, they were clearly s serving homosexuals because this guy over here is, to my eyes, so clearly gay. Uh, and he has had a drink served uh, to him. Um, and we're trying to find out who he is. Uh, we've recently been told that somebody, uh, somebody thinks they know who he is and that he's still alive, so we're anxious to, to interview him. He, um, this got press, uh, and, and um, the New York Times wrote a really nasty article about deviants uh, seeking a drink, and the Village Voice wrote a really positive article uh, that, about uh, three homosexuals in search of a drink. Uh, and, it did get the state liquor authority to announce that they never had such a ruling that you couldn't serve homosexuals a drink. Uh, and although this was a complete lie, it did make it uh, a place where gay people could go. Uh, it now made it more easy for gay people to go into a bar and order a drink and leads to 
eventually to gay-owned bars rather than mafia-owned bars. And so we wish we could say thank you all for coming and let's go into Julius's and have a drink. And I hope that someday we can do that. We can give a tour and end up at Julius's and all go in for a festive drink. Uh, but we want to invite everybody uh, to, um, to order out a, a, a t-shirt from us in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first March, which was this Saturday, the Christopher Street Liberation Day. And you can see Ken and I are both wearing our t-shirts uh, and, and uh, you can order them uh, online. So uh, it's taken us just about an hour uh, to do this, which is great. And we would welcome your questions. Uh, so uh, let's, let, uh, uh, I'm going to hand it back to Michelle, who I think uh, will tell us how we're going to do the questions. I'm assuming uh, that it will be through chat and you'll send in the questions uh, and, and uh, we'll be able to answer them. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Okay, we, 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 we do have the chat here. Uh, and so if you have questions, please uh, uh, put your questions in, in that. Um, so I see that there are uh, two questions here uh, from Ken Frankel. So did Ed Koch directly involved in persecuting the owners of the Duchess uh, or the LGB community in general? Uh, well, I don't think he was directly involved, but certainly his administration was involved with the Duchess, um, and it, it was it was it was written up at the time, and it, you know the morals division went in and raided them, so it was really outrageous. And you know, did he you know persecute the LGBT community in general? Well, on the heels of Larry Kramer dying, I would say yes because he of his inaction. <laughs> So that's uh, sort of skirting the direct answer about the Duchess. I don't have a direct answer about that. And you know, Ed Koch is an interesting figure from our perspective. And we've just, you know, in our, on our website, whenever we're discussing a, a, a topic and there's a, a, an LGBT person, we bold them. And we, we you know, we're, it's, it's really difficult. What do you do, do you, how to bold people that were, were gay, but were also homophobic? Um, you know, Cone, uh, you know, how do we deal with, with, with this aspect of, of, of gay life in the closet? Um, and it's a, it's a, that's a challenge. We did, we, we have uh, bolded uh, Ed Koch, where we mentioned him uh, relating to Larry Kramer at 2 Fifth Avenue. Okay, another question from Charles Kaminsky. When I went there in the mid 1970s, it was told to me that homos weren't welcome at Julius's. Is there any note of this? Well, there are, there are um, a couple of, of, of uh, online biographies of, of, of gay life in New York uh, in the 60s and from interviews. Uh, we have learned that Julius's own, only very gently gay people uh, in. They didn't want to become a gay bar, and it never became, uh, in the early years, in the 60s, it wasn't entirely a gay bar. Uh, it, was, it was a mixed bar. Uh, and and um, so people saw it as a kind of place of last resort. They didn't find it that welcoming uh, to be there, but it was also not as sleazy as some of the, the mafia bars were. So it, the, for, for uh, for a collegiate crowd and a kind of suit and tie crowd after work, uh, it became much more welcoming uh, or much more inviting, even if it wasn't 100% welcoming. Yeah, and, and there are accounts where if you were going in alone, you were told you can't come in, you have to come in with a woman. So ways to make sure it didn't totally turn. And I should just say, you know, on the heels of this, we had it listed on the National Register on the 50th anniversary of the SIPIN in 2016. Um, and the current owner of the bar um, has been wonderful and is an amazing steward of the Julius, Julius's history. Yeah, it was our first National Register nomination. Uh, so that was really thrilling to get it listed exactly at the 50th anniversary of, of the sipping. Uh, so um, Sarah Bean Atman wanted to know how Lorraine Hansberry died and Ken responded that she died of cancer. Uh, so. I don't see any other questions here. I can't believe there are no other questions. Uh, 
So uh, if you have any other questions, uh, send them in right away. Um, otherwise, I think I'll say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, so um, it, it, it was great, and I hope that we can do this live uh, one day out on the street on a beautiful uh, summer uh, on a beautiful summer evening. Uh, I love giving tours uh, after uh, after work in June uh, when it stays light and the weather's really beautiful. Uh, so look at our website. Uh, join us on social media. Uh, as Ken said, we have a very robust social media presence. And uh, if you're interested in, in uh, our great t-shirt, uh, they're, they're, they're selling really fast. So um, uh, if, you, if you want one, send in an order. And it, uh, and it all goes to help support um, our project. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, HCC. Thanks guys, this was great. Thank you so much to everyone who came. Uh, this has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube page, along with all of our other uh, virtual walking tours that we've done and some actual in-person walking tours that we did prior to uh, COVID. So you can check that out. And uh, yes, hopefully next year we will have a proper grassroots party in the garden and we can celebrate in person. Look forward to it. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. What's that? I said good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>